So if you're going to get, say, a $200,000 tax credit or rebate, you're going to need the $200,000 to make the movie, and then you're going to get it back a year later. Mm. So I frankly treat those as revenue because of the timing of the money. Well, welcome to Industry Insights. My name is Jim Ellis, and this is Elias Acosta. And this is a show where we bring in industry professionals to share their knowledge and their experience to the next generation of filmmakers. That's right, Jim. And, you know, when we talk about uh, up and coming uh, film uh, personnel, whether they are writers, directors, cinematographers, they're always looking for fresh information how to advance in their uh, career into a professional class A kind of a, <laughs> a worker, but they're looking for information and yeah. we had to get the right information. That's why this platform exists and we wanted to get the message across to so many people that want to become filmmakers. Yeah, the right information, that's the key, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, you can get the wrong information and go down the wrong roads and, mm -hmm. and that's why we have Mr. Jeff Deverett here. He's a producer, director, mm -hmm. consultant, uh, professor, uh, I think you do catering too, right? <laughs> the whole list of things. But I, it, I it, eat the food. I don't make yeah. it. <laughs> but, you know, as an independent film producer, you know, you do have to jump into many roles. Uh, he's done us films such as um, Full Out 2, Kiss and Cry, God Incorporated, a lot of successful films. That's a big mm. word to put in front of uh, that. Uh, and so he's definitely proven himself in the industry, uh, originally from Canada. And uh, now here in the United States with his wonderful wife. And so uh, we're looking forward to spending some time with him and learning about budgeting on this first uh, show here. Um, well, thanks for coming, Jeff. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Good to see you again. We met a number of years ago, uh, uh, introducing him to our new stage we had in Mar Vista Drive. Uh, that was fun. I was super impressed. Mm -hmm. I expected to see nothing, and we pull up and see this beautiful soundstage. Yeah, he didn't think Vista <laughs> had anything to offer, as <laughs> uh, as uh, a lot of people. But we, we live here, and we wanted to develop the film industry here. And uh, Elias, uh, of course, and I um, did a film, predominantly filmed in, the, in this area, where most people said, you can't film here. There's no talent. There's no stages. There's yeah, no equipment. Right. And... Uh, but we did it anyway. And, and it was fun to meet you because you had the same heart and desire was to develop the film industry here as an alternative. Right. And I know, you know, it's a little tough in certain areas because we don't have maybe the tax credits that some places have. But, you know, you're, you're always thinking about how to develop it. And, um, and I always appreciated that. So, uh, yeah, I, and, and I think that this is when... People come together with an idea and they further develop, they're going to see results. But it doesn't stay there, you know, and we're going to see as a uh, Jefferson marketing expert and we're going to talk about budget, but also how that affects everything that we do. And I think the first question, uh, if we start on this, would be on um, budgeting. How do we do that? How? What are the steps that an indie uh, can do to start, you know, working on the project or putting it together. Okay. I mean, <laughs> this is right up my alley. Okay. By the way, I just want to tell you before you mentioned Vista, I mean, I drove into Vista this morning. It is beautiful. Yeah. This neighborhood has just blossomed. It's mm -hmm. changed it's, a little. It's special. I mean, yeah. what they've done here is, I mean, this building's fantastic, but the whole neighborhood looks fantastic. Yeah, thanks. And matter of fact, yeah, I should mention that we are in downtown Vista at the Film Hub, and this is the podcast studio here. And so uh, we're very thrilled to see you know, Vista develop. And it's actually taken on the, um, it's the role of art, entertainment and arts. It's part of their focus now. If you noticed on the way in, there's a couple of apartments designed for artists that are just finished. And so we're really thrilled with the direction it's going. And, uh, of course, very glad to be here. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Really mm. nice. Okay, budgeting. Mm -hmm. All right, <laughs> you know, you get me started on this stuff, and you're gonna have to you're gonna have to interrupt me because I got a lot to say on some of <laughs> well, these. Well, that's good. That's 
Okay. So, um, as you mentioned, I do, I mean, I am a filmmaker. I've made seven features, so Mm -hmm. I know all about budgeting from that point of view, but I also am a professor at San Diego State University where I teach budgeting. So Mm -hmm. I can give you, I'm going to give you sort of the overview on the academic side, what I teach, Mm -hmm. which is very applicable to the real scenario. Okay. So I always say to my students that there's, there's two types of budgeting. There's what I call top down budgeting and bottom up budgeting. And this is for, I'm talking about indie films here, all right? Studio films are done a little bit differently, Mm -hmm. but let's just talk about independent features. So the way it works is the first thing you do is you you take your script and you have to do a script breakdown. Mm -hmm. I mean, you basically have to dissect your script, take, go scene by scene and look at all the elements in each of the scenes. So the location, obviously, um, the, the actors, the props, the, you know, every, all the elements mm-hmm. that you're going to require to shoot that scene. And then you put them on and you, you're basically going to schedule the movie. So you put them on to a strip board and you can use the software that's available out there. I mean, I do it on a spreadsheet myself and basically they're all built on Excel style platforms, but all the, the movie magics and all mm-hmm. the studio binders and softwares, they're all really good. Um, but basically what they do is they just break the script down and, and contain it by scene so you know all the elements. And of course, a movie's not shot in order, right? It's shot out of order. So then you have to do, in order to do a proper budget, you first have to do a proper schedule. Because you can't really budget without knowing, the, the number one thing is how many days you're going to shoot, right? And, and sort of how many actors and, and sort of the type of crew you need and locations. I mean, these are all things that factor into a budget. So the only way you can know that for sure is to schedule the movie. So budgeting starts with scheduling. So you have to do a pretty good script breakdown and a pretty good accurate schedule. Once you have that, and you know, we can get into details if you want to. I mean, I'm really big into, I'm a control freak when it comes to the schedule because mm-hmm. every day costs a lot of money. So you want to make sure that you're very efficient with your shooting days, but you also, you know, want to, you don't want to rush it too much you need the time to get the coverage and in, in the shoot and everything. So, you know, you can shoot features in 10 days if you want. I generally take 20 days mm-hmm. or 20, between 20 and 25, just because I don't want to rush too quickly because I want the actors to have time to do several takes and I want different co- angles and that type of thing. So schedule, it starts with scheduling. All right. So now you've got the schedule, you kind of know where you're going to shoot, how many days you're going to shoot, what's involved in the shoot. So a typical budget, basically, we're going to start with what I call the top-down budget. So you're going to go at the top, and if you look at a regular budget, it's basically, it's got, you know, what we call above the line and below the line. So above the line is generally scenario, which is the writer, whoever writes the script, and maybe, you know, the editor, you know, script editor, that type of thing. Then you've got director, you've got producer, and you've got A-list cast or major cast. That's above the line. So you're going to put those in and you're basically going to say, okay, those are primarily usually flat fees. You're going to pay a writer a flat fee. You're not going to pay a daily rate to a writer, generally a producer, a director. You're going to negotiate flat fees. So you're going to stick that in and you're going to, that's going to be your above the line costs. Now below the line is all the actors, which is a big category. So these are, you know, if you're using, let's talk about SAG actors, you know, if they have a schedule based on what your ultimate budget is, you'll be able to put in how many days each actor is going to be there. And by the way, each of these has their own schedules, you know, like the actors have the day of days. And so you know exactly what they're going to do, but the budget just consolidates it all. So um, there's going to, it's going to start with actors, then, you know, then everything involved with that, if there's any travel or ancillaries or that type of thing, then there's going to be, it's basically starts with all the labor. So you've got the actors, the crew, all of the other elements that are labor, then, and those each have lines. So in a detailed budget, every crew member would be on separate line. You'd have cinematographer, you know, DPs, all the, all, every element, all the sound people would have their own lines. So there could be, you know, hundred lines just for crew in a detailed budget. All right. Um, Then, then you're going to have all of the hard costs after that. So it's going to be your equipment costs, you know, your location costs, all your kit fees, all the stuff that's involved in the shoot. So those will all be itemized in separate lines. Um, and then, then generally speaking, you will have um, catering, craft, all this kind of stuff in that section. 
All right, then, so that's section B, what I call. So A is above the line, then B is the first section below the line, then C would be post-production. So you're going to budget all your post-production ahead of time. A common error that indie filmmakers make is not budgeting post-production. And then they run out of money because they didn't think about it. You've got to pre-budget all of your post-production too. So you've got, you know, your editor, your editing suites, um, all your sound mixing, your music rights, all this kind of stuff. So that's a pretty extensive budget too. It takes a lot of time and effort to do that properly. And then, so that would be section C. And then section D would be what I call admin miscellaneous. So that would be your legals, your accounting, if you're doing tax credits, all that kind of processing, um, publicity, um, office, other thing, insurance. So those things would go there because um, people like to look at that separately. So that's also an extensive area and you got to get that right. A lot of people forget to budget E&O insurance and pretty well every movie needs an E&O policy. So go ahead and explain what that is. Oh, yeah. that's called errors and omissions. And basically um, you need that to most streamers or broadcasters require that to make sure that you're insured against any misusage of, of a rights issue. Like for instance, you shoot a building that has a logo on it. Um, and they didn't, you didn't get authorized or licensed to do that, then you could get sued for that. And they, right. that indemnifies them and helps, you know, cover the costs of that action. Um, so all those are d d done, all right? Then you basically add it all. So each item would be, say, for mm -hmm. cast, right? It mm -hmm. would be this, num this actor for, you know, 18 days times the daily rate, and you'd multiply it across, you get a total. And you do that for everything. You know, I need this camera for this number of days, this dolly, this uh, sound equipment, blah, blah. And you just line item every single thing. And by the way, a big budget could be 60 or 70 pages, yeah. you know. And, and then so you line it and you multiply it across and you've got the totals coming down. And then each section has a total and then you total those totals. And then you get to sort of the subtotal. And then the last thing is what we call a contingency so you'd add that all up. And generally, I like to add a 10% contingency. So if my budget comes out to say $800,000, I'm going to add in another 10%, so another $80,000 in contingency. And contingency is if something goes wrong. It's mm -hmm. the rainy day fund. Like what happens if something goes wrong? You got some extra money budgeted so that you can cover certain things that you didn't expect. Yeah. And on a movie shoot, something always something goes wrong. Go wrong. Mm -hmm. So you need contingency. Exactly. All right. And yeah. you don't in your mind think you're going to use it for something else. You're going to use it to solve a problem generally. Okay, hold on. Let me finish. Okay, then you add that all up and you get to the total at the bottom. So I just made up a number. I said $880,000. All right. So that the reason I call that a top-down budget is because you started at the top you multiplied all your lines across, you added them all up, and you ended with a total at the bottom. That is the classic proper way to budget. Yeah. But, but not necessarily for indie movies. Okay. Okay? Go there. So, <laughs> so I kind of made this term up, the top-down, bottom-up budget, because it was the only thing that made sense, especially when I started teaching it, right? So typically on an indie film, so now you know you need $880,000 to shoot this film. Again, I made the number up, okay? Yeah. Just for... Hmm discussion purposes. But then you got to go raise the money. See, you're an indie filmmaker and you got to go find that money. So what happens if you go out there and you do your best and you can only find $650,000, but your budget says $880,000? The question every indie filmmaker struggles with is, do I make the movie or don't I? I got $650,000. Can I make the movie for $650,000? So what you do is you go through a reverse process of what you just did and you put the 650 at the bottom line, that's your total, and then you go backwards up the budget and redeploy all those resources and say, okay, do I really need this? Can I get away with, you know, $12 a day in catering as opposed to 20? Can I cut out a couple of crew? Can I shave off something in the number of shooting days. Can I, and you go backwards up the budget and redeploy all the resources based on what you know, the funds that are available to you. And if you think you can get your movie finished, you know, for the, with, without compromising too much, then that's what your budget becomes. It becomes the number at the bottom line starts the whole process and you go backwards up it. So that's what I call a bottom up budget. Mm. And generally that's what happens with indie filmmakers. They start with a top-down budget of saying, hey, the goal would be 880, but they can't raise enough money, so they have to decide, 
based mm. on the money they can raise, do you do the film? And sometimes mm. you shouldn't do the film. Mm-hmm. Okay, sometimes you're just compromising too much. Like you come in at 400,000, that's all you can raise, less than half of what you really need. I mean, should you attempt to make that movie? Because you might not be able to make the movie you really want to make. So it's a decision. Yeah. No, now, and in, in given all that complex and all layers and layers of the information, and you have your final numbers, now comes in, in the whole process, where is the directors and line producers and everything in relationship? Oh, those are people that you just add on, and this is what I got to offer you for this job, or you take into consideration. In terms of the their fees, like the, the numbers, or, where, or in terms of participating in this process? Participating. Oh, in, in this process. process. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, first of all, you are talking to potentially the biggest control freak in the film industry right here. Mm-hmm. I am very particular about numbers because mm-hmm. I do not like to go over budget and I generally use private financing and I'm very, very particular about protecting my my investors' money. So the problem, and I, I'm not, it, it, it's a common occurrence. I'm not going to say it happens all the time, but... When you get a director involved in this process, they're just looking at the artistic side of making exactly. the movie. Mm-hmm. They're not really thinking numbers. So they're generally going to push you, say, for more shooting days because they want to take more time mm-hmm. to sh- have more coverage and they want more elements to, to make the, look, the movie look better because that's their job. Their job is make a great looking movie. And the more money you have, the generally the better you can make the movie look. So they're not focused on protecting the bottom line. They're focused on the artistic side of making a great movie. And you can't blame them. That is their job. All right. But a producer has to be focused on bringing the movie in on time and on budget if they're responsible, because ultimately you have to sell it. And you don't, if you go over budget too much, you might not make your money back. So I'm very, I, you know, I generally lean on the producer side because I'm so fiscally responsible. So I generally, the truth is I generally don't like to get the director involved in this process, even though you do have to get the director involved for sometimes because you got to say, can you shoot this right. in 20 days? Right. Like, that's what mm-hmm. I'm scheduling. Are we going to be able to do this? And if she says, no, we can't do it that time. I need 23. It's a discussion. And you might have to say, we can't afford 23. We have to, can we do 21? I mean, it's it's a discussion like any business discussion. But you got to be in sync with your director. The producer and the director have to be in sync. Because if they're not, there's going to be this headbutting that goes on the whole time, and you're going to the producer will get frustrated because the director will take more time and and go over budget, and and it'll be a, a battle as opposed to you know good experience. So the, okay, now, now the line producer also has to be involved here because they're managing the whole operation basically. So um, generally, by the way, the line producer does the budget. Yeah, I mean, exactly. in a typical situation, exactly. the line producer does the budget. Okay, but because of who I am, the control freak that I am, and and because I'm so focused on protecting investor dollars, I generally keep that role myself because I want to have final say over that because I want final control, in, 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 including the artistic final control, because if it comes down to missing a shooting day because the director went too slow or whatever, um, I sometimes will pull rank and say, sorry, we need to move on. We're going to have to, you know, figure out a better solution because yes, the movie is going to suffer, but we need to have a movie because we need to be able to sell something at the end of the day. So often I I can tell you, listen, I love directing because it's the most fun thing on a set. But the primary reason that I started directing is so that I didn't have to battle with the director. (laughs) (laughs) That is the primary reason. So that I could be producer and director and only have that battle Mm -hmm. with myself. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, it's great. You have the talent to do all of that. You know. uh, the, listen, the best, most fun job on set is directing by far. I mean, if, you know, if you're comfortable and confident mm-hmm. and everything, but I mean, that's the, that's the artistic component of making a movie and it's great. And, but you know, see when you're the producer and the director, I mean, it's a lot of work. And by the way, I surround myself with lots of really good people, as you know, you know, mm-hmm. met some of them, Barb. Mm-hmm. And so the, these people are, they are, we're in sync and they know. I mean, I, you know, they're watching the clock. They're helping me there because they know what my agenda is. Yeah. So we're all in sync. So I would never, like, if one of my assistants came on to set and said, hey, you know, we're running, you know, a little late, I would say, thank you very much. I would say, mm-hmm. don't get off, you know, I'd say, get out of here. I'm going to take yeah. whatever time, mm-hmm. which is what a typical mm-hmm. director might say. I would say, thank you for letting me know. And then I would reschedule and speed things up. 
And the other thing that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of filmmakers don't like to work with me, especially, um, you know, first ADs or line producers mm -hmm. is because I control the schedule. Like it's on my computer. And when something needs to change, like I'll come on set sometimes, I'll say, we're going to change up the shooting day a little bit, or we're going to, you know, reschedule this or something based on lots of moving parts, right? There's things happen, weather happens, you know, locations cancel, actors get sick. I mean, all the stuff that happens, right? So you need to be able to pivot really quickly. And, and the worst thing you could do is lose shooting time. Yeah. I mean, you've got a whole crew standing there and equipment and everything that you've rented. So you, like I have plans and then contingency plans and then contingencies on the contingencies. Like the show goes on, on my set. It, 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 there's a tornado runs through the cover no problem. Oh, we got man. other plans for tornado watch. No, that's like awesome. Yeah. But mm -hmm. that involves a lot of planning and it involves being able to pivot quickly. So you got to be able to get on your computer. And that's why um, some of the software that's available, like there's good, mm -hmm. like Studio Binder, you know, and Movie yeah, Man, these are everything. good programs. Yeah, they got it. But right. they're not quick enough for me. Yeah. I mm -hmm. build my own spreadsheets so that I can sort them and, and focus on get to the point. I, I put in 10 times the amount of detail that Studio Binder <laughs> puts in. I put in all the availabilities, the act, I put in everything. So I have it at a fingertip so I can know how to pivot on, like I can sort... There must be, I have columns, I must have 60 or 70 columns in my spreadsheets mm -hmm. for everything. So I can sort on any um, item very quickly to re-pivot so that I don't go, you know, so I don't waste shooting time. The Film Hub is the future of co-working in downtown Vista. Get energized in an inspiring work environment that is built for your success. With multiple membership options for workspace and private offices, you can become a part of our co-working community. The Film Hub makes it easier to produce the professional content your business needs. From video production, live streams, photo shoots, or in-person events, you can create all this and more in our audio and video facilities. Love your work and where you accomplish it. The Film Hub. You know, what are the red flags as you go? You look into it. It's a shooting day coming up. We're going to open up first the scene and everything. And all of a sudden, red flags are here and there. Now, red flags, as somebody said, if your line producer or producers are a little bit, you know, more likely you're going to have those if they're not prepared. But for you, since you control so much, have you run into that? And if you run into that, what are what are the solutions that you have seen? Yeah, I mean, you? you know, we're we're kind of shifting off of budgeting a little bit and into operations and filmmaking, but yeah. that's fine. Okay, so but you know, you you know the red flags. You you direct. You, you're on set, so you know. Okay, but I'll tell you what I consider the red mm -hmm. flags. Okay, number one red flag: bad attitude. Bad attitude with crew is a bad is a red flag. Because you get one bad apple can upset the entire bushel and you got to address that very quickly. Somebody's disgruntled, somebody's upset, somebody, you know, isn't cooperating and being a team player. Because on a small indie shoot, it is super collaborative. Everybody's got to be in sync because you mm -hmm. are moving quickly and you don't have the luxury of missing days or, or slowing down or taking time. You got to all be in sync. So mm -hmm. one of the big red flags is when somebody's not in sync. And I generally, the way I deal with that is I pull them aside and I say, what's the problem? What's mm -hmm. the issue? And we discuss it. And sometimes they say, Jeff, you're the issue. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, guess what? This is my shoot. So if you got an issue, you might want to find another shoot. Mm -hmm. And I deal with that very quickly mm -hmm. because that can poison the whole mix. Okay. I mean, other red flags are, but they're not red flags. They're expected, you know, weather equipment failure. Equipment yeah. failure is always a big one, but I expect that. Yeah. Okay. No, and, and what I what I meant about reflect is how that can impact your budget if you don't take quick actions. You you basically yeah. lose like everything's about mm -hmm. shooting time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When you schedule 20 days for a shoot, mm -hmm. you don't you take be. 21 days. Mm -hmm. All right? You don't, I, mm -hmm. I I'm an advocate of don't take 19 days either. Mm -hmm. You're not a hero mm -hmm. if you take 19 yeah. days. Take your 20 days, spread it out, mm -hmm. use it as effectively as possible to make the best movie you possibly can. Mm -hmm. But when you're scheduled for 20 days, take 20 days. Now, if you do have the luxury of maybe some other funds mm -hmm. and there's something that you feel will really enhance your project, maybe you'll take another day or so. Mm -hmm. But you see, the other thing is, remember, 
I'm also like my, the primary role that I play in the movie making thing is, is distributor, mm. you know, making mm. the movies is the fun part, but I'm the guy who sells them. So when you're selling them, you know, basically how much, you know, the range of how much you're going to get. Mm. So you don't want to spend more because you're not getting it no, back no, no, no. on the sales right. side. So mm -hmm. if you're in it to make money, you got to know, you know, you can't spend too much on your product because you can't get the, the revenue to cover it. And so that, budget. Over yeah, I was going to say that brings get, up a good question. Yeah. It's like, is there a number, a magic number that you try to stay under as far as production costs in light of selling and making money? I mean, you, obviously, if you right. have millions of dollars, but is there too much spending too much to, where it's difficult to sell that project? Okay. Well, this is this discussion leads into distribution, obviously, because it's all about how much revenue is available. It's sort of the range of revenue that's available for the movie you're making. So I'm going to say. Different genres have different ranges. Like there's the whole low budget horror thing, right? I mean, people can shoot low budget horrors for ten thousand dollars. You know, mm -hmm. mostly nobody goes over. I'm going to say two fifty on a low budget horror because you don't have to. All right, you can make a decent movie at that range. The question is, how much can you make with it? So that that area of of the movie business is very saturated because a lot it's easy to make those kind of movies. So a lot of people do those kind of movies. So there's thousands of them out there. And, you know, knowing how to monetize them and what your range is. But I'm going to say to you, like, you can tell me, you know, I do sports dramas, right? So I'm telling you that in, in the sports drama arena, um, do not spend over a million dollars. You are not going to get your money back mm. if you spend over a million. Unless, mm. unless you jump to, say, five million and add an A-list actor. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, put Dennis Quaid in or something like mm -hmm. that and make it into that kind of caliber movie. But in between a million and five million... That's no man's land. That's mm. really going to be hard to monetize. Interesting. All right. Yeah. So, and that's today. Five years ago or th even three years ago, I would have told you a million and a half. Mm -hmm. But today it's become more difficult. Mm. But horror, I would say don't spend more than 250 Okay. And, you know, unless it's really high concept, very big special effects oriented horror, you know, like studio mm -hmm. style horror, mm -hmm. then it's different. But remember, I'm talking indie films here, okay? Yeah. I'm not talking studio films. Exactly. So there's, it's a different industry right. altogether. That's what we're involved in. Yeah. 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 That what I was yeah. thinking about was um, when you're writing a film, you know, you have to keep budget in mind when you're writing, if you're going to write and produce, right? So is there any tips in writing uh, to keep the budget numbers low? What do you look at? Uh, you mentioned a little bit about, mm -hmm. uh, but as far as, you know, obviously, uh, you know, a plane crash, it's, Cost a little bit to produce. Correct. That. So what some tips on that? Okay. Well, first of all, you got it. You start with the genre, right? So within a genre, let's, let's, I, which do you want to talk any certain genre? You want to talk horror? Let's family? do your genre. Family. Okay. So my genre is sports dramas, generally based on true stories. So the big mm -hmm. production costs in the movies that I do. So I know that I got to go for not more than a million dollars. Used to be like some of the earlier movies were a million five, a million three. But now I'm trying to stick to a million or less, okay? Because that's what I can monetize. So within that, the big production scenes in sports dramas are generally like stadium scenes and big games where you're going to put 5,000 people into a stadium or something and have a big game between two teams or a gymnastics meet in my sake, you know, case or, you know, that, that's where the big production scenes come in. So the question is how big can they be? Now, you got to have some big looking stuff to make your movie look yeah. decent. Okay. Now, these days you can cheat some of that. You can put 500 people into a, ten, you know, 50,000 person stadium and fill, it up. and fill them up, you know, by either digitally or just mm -hmm. setting your camera a certain way and moving the audience and having them change clothes. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Right. Yeah. And you got to be smart that way. But, but you can't, you, you, these are, these are scenes that sell your movie and make your movie entertaining. So you need production value to make yeah. a good movie and to make a good trailer. So you don't want to put a hundred people in when you need at least 500, but it's got to look like 5,000 mm. or something like that. So that's the cost for me. So when you're writing, when I, when I either hire somebody to write or they write, you know, I'll say, okay, put in the big production scenes, but I'm going to probably dial them down a little bit. You know, like for instance, I'm looking at doing a, a football movie now. Right? And they're talking about, you know, doing an NFL game. And I said, no, 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 no. We're not, we, you, you can't, we're not going to be able to afford to do it unless, unless the, if the main financial people are the people who own the NFL team. And even then I'm not sure they're going to get the rights to use NFL and all this yeah. kind of stuff. I mean, you can't, you got to write around that kind of stuff. But with the NFL now, you can 
obtain all those cardboard people they used in the last two years. I know, but you can't get the right to say NFL yeah. or any no, sport can, teams. It's, it's not about the cardboard strict. people. Yeah. We don't care about <laughs> that. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's, it's about rights. And, yeah. and, you know, yeah. even look at I shoot a lot of college films, right? So the NCAA, which is mm -hmm. the governing body for college sports. I mean, you have lots of rules there. Yeah. Tons of rules. So you got to. So look at a lot of writers don't know about this kind of stuff and they don't mm -hmm. know. So mm -hmm. I let them write because you want good storytelling. So I let them write, mm -hmm. but I tell them there's a good chance I'm going to have to dial back some of the big stuff that they write, you know, because it, we're just not going to be able to afford it. But I like, I like the big storytelling because it does enhance the movie and you want to tell a good story, sure. but you, you, you know, ultimately you got to tell it within your budget. And you've written most of your films, right? I, okay. So the way it works is I write the first draft, but I'm not a great writer, but I, I think I'm a good storyteller. So I write the first draft then I give it to a writer and then they re write the dialogue. Like I always say, as, as my kids, you know, my oldest son once said to me, said that the only thing cool about you is that you actually know you're not cool. <laughs> so, and I took that as a compliment mm. that could, I could take that as, but what that meant was, it's like, you're writing for, you know, 12 year old girls in a gymnastics movie. You, you don't talk like a 12 year old girl. You can't right. write the dialogue for right. them. Mm -hmm. You need a writer who knows what they say right. and make it work. And you. he's right. He's, it was absolutely right. So I always hire writers generally to do dialogue, to do scenarios, mm -hmm. to stuff that I'm just not cool about that. I'm not familiar, with, but, but, but I do all the main story plot and plot mm -hmm. points so that I, the story moves in a certain direction and, and ends up where I want it to be. But but they always fill in the holes. So every you'll see on all my movies, even it's written by, there's always like a co-writer or story editor or something like that who comes in and really kind of enhances, makes it more, um, for lack of a better word, cool or relevant to the audience. Right, right. But you do have a cool accent. <laughs> so the only one that I, I mean, you know, this newest movie of mine called God Incorporated, I mean, that is speaks to me as a person. And so I wrote most of that, you know, there's, I did have a story editor who helped me make it a little more cool for university student age people, but uh, I, I did a lot of that. Oh, that's great. Is your brother involved in that? Only as an influence, but not his, yeah, his, yeah, he's involved, but because it's, it's all based on, you know, uh, for the audience, my brother, the movie, okay, just, just. I opened me, up a whole thing. <laughs> mm. In a nutshell, the movie is called God Incorporated and the log line is, Controversy ensues when four business school students create and launch a new religion on campus. So the story is about, you know, four MBA students to graduate have to create a new business and they, they decide religion's the best business and they create a new religion and they launch and it's super controversial. So Jim asked me if my brother's involved because he knows that my brother is ultra religious mm -hmm. and I'm not. Mm -hmm. So the, the sort of the motivation to tell this whole story was because of our relationship right. and the things we argue about. That's not awesome. Yeah. And coming to budgeting again, uh, software, what do you recommend for Indies out there? They're looking how to start up in the right way and they need the assistance of a software to work with. What do you recommend? What is out there? I, I, I look at, there's about five decent off the shelf programs and, you know, mm -hmm. I forget all the gorilla and yeah. movie magic and, but I, I like studio binder when mm -hmm. I'm going to use a piece of software, just cause I like the support and this, the speed and, and just the platform. Mm -hmm. But the truth is I don't use any of them because I'm really good on a spreadsheet mm -hmm. and they're all basically based on, you know, Excel yeah. spreadsheet technology, mm -hmm. you know, formatting. So, and I feel like I can customize better even though they're fantastic. So mm -hmm. here's my advice. Mm -hmm. If you're an indie filmmaker and you are going to be a producer, you need to know how to use a spreadsheet because mm -hmm. spreadsheets are the major business tool and budgeting and scheduling and everything is all spreadsheet based. So even if you're going to use these programs, you got to understand how spreadsheets work. So I teach scheduling and budgeting on, on Excel spreadsheets, yeah. just so they'll understand the foundations of it and how to yeah. set it up and really get in under the hood. But I do show them primarily studio binder. And again, I'm not trying to plug one over the other because yeah. they're all pretty good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and like movie magic is good because it integrates the script yeah. right into the budget. Yeah. And so, so mm -hmm. some of them have different bells and whistles. Um, but I stopped using them years ago just because I found I could create more control by building it myself. But you got to be good on a spreadsheet to be able to do that and comfortable with it. 
Yeah. Because I know there's a lot of formulas in there. If one go wrong, that alter the numbers and everything. So when somebody doesn't know, because I receive sometimes some of those budgets, and then I go under their hood, Correct. and I see information being dragged even from another project, yeah. and you unlock those and say, oh, what we got here. Right. So, But that's yeah. why when you build it yourself, as I do, you know exactly where every, th uh, yeah. every element, every mm -hmm. formula, you know exactly mm -hmm. why you did what you exactly. did. Exactly, exactly. You know, I think one thing uh, our audience might be interested in hearing about, just touching on, because I know it's a big subject all on its own, is financing. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I hear Jeff say it all the time. He goes, oh, that's the easy part. You know, in, in most people's minds, that's not the case. So maybe uh, touch on that. Why, oh, why is that so hold on, easy? Hold on. No, for no, you? no. I said <laughs> making the movie is the easy part. <laughs> financing and distribution are the tough part. The, the filming, the production of the movie, as much as there's a lot of moving parts and very difficult, that's the party. Mm -hmm. Here, I mean, I, I, if, I don't know if the camera can pick this up, but like here's a feature, an indie feature film. Okay. So I'm going to spread my arms all the way out. I can't, I don't know what the angles are, but mm -hmm. if you can't see it, they're already split out. So from there to here, that's financing. From here to here is distribution and marketing, which is selling and marketing your film. And this little thing in the middle, that's production, which is all the stuff that everybody wants to talk about. Shooting, directing, <laughs> acting, you know, sound, cinematography. So that's production. This is a party for me. This is my six week party to have mm -hmm. a good time. Everybody says, but you're working 15 hours a day and you're doing, and I said, yeah, mm -hmm. that's the party. Yeah. Once that ends, wait till you go to sell your movie. Then you'll see what the movie business is all about. All right, but let's talk about the financing, all right? So financing, you know, these days for a feature, indie feature, is a very risky venture. And, and the, the elements basically involved in finance are, as you know, because you've done it, number one is private investment. Like the core of your financial model is going to be from private investors. And if you're not connected with, say, what I call high net worth individuals who have the ability to take some chances, like angel capital who... And I say, take some chances, meaning they can give you a hundred grand or something. And if they lose it all, they're not going to change. It's not going to change their lifestyle. That's what the kind of investor you need, because mm -hmm. otherwise it's going to be too risky for them to take a chance with you. All right. But if they believe in you and they see your vision and your business plan and all this kind of stuff, they have the ability to do that. So that's the kind of private investors you need. These high net worth individuals, that's going to be the core of your financial plan. Right. But you know, there's other components like you could crowdfund. You know, I teach that too. A lot of indie films do crowdfunding. It's not easy. It, it's very challenging, but you can do it. You can do either reward-based crowdfunding where you're, it's a donation and you're given, you know, like a credit or you're given, you know, digital screeners, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's primarily Indiegogo, Kickstarter, and Seed and Spark. Those are the three big platforms for crowd-based or for a donation slash reward-based. Or you can do equity-based crowdfunding. So the SEC recently, you know, a few years ago opened up. Um, so small investors, non-accredited investors can actually invest in movies now. And there's some big platforms for that too. Um, like WeFunder, StartEngine, um, MovieFunder. So there's a, these are equity-based crowdfunding platforms. But generally you want to be doing budgets of a million dollars or more because there's a lot of setup fees and charges and all that kind of stuff. It's a lot more complicated. So you can do that as well. All right. So crowdfunding is another component. So tax credits, obviously a big component, um, but tax credits, I, can, I so you can go to certain states mm -hmm. that will give you either a tax credit or a rebate. And a rebate's not a tax credit. It's a little bit different. Everybody throws them under the same umbrella. But a rebate is when the government says to you, the local film commission says, okay, if you spend a certain amount of money in our region, hiring our people, using our resources, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff, we'll give you back, say, 25% of what you spent. And that's great. You should do that. But that's not financing. See, people think it's financing. You build it into your financial model, but the reason it's not financing is because you don't get the money until after you've done it, like six months or 12 months or even yeah. sometimes two years <laughs> after. So you can, it's, it, that creates cash flow issues because mm -hmm. you got to have the, fina the financing in place to shoot them. So if you're going to get, say, a $200,000 tax credit or rebate, you're going to need the $200,000 to make the movie, mm -hmm. and then you're going to get it back a year later mm -hmm. So I frankly treat those as revenue because of the timing of the money. So some people treat it as finance and then they go and they realize they're going to run out of cash. So they have to go and loan against that tax credit. And there's exactly. a lot of fees involved and aggravation in terms of borrowing against the tax credit. Yeah, that's so correct. that's the whole financing thing. Okay. Yeah, that's great.
Yeah, in some states, you know, uh, sometimes they even run out of, uh, of the package that they got available. And so bigger movie, take bigger cuts. And because then- they're not managing their cash flow properly. So cash flow is a, is a very, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, generally filmmakers don't understand the difference between cash mm-hmm. and finance. Mm-hmm. All right. So, mm-hmm. so cash is what you have on hand to actually spend mm-hmm. to make mm-hmm. your money. Whereas financing is what your overall picture is going to look like. Mm-hmm. So there's a timing issue. And that's yeah. why a lot of filmmakers run into cash flow problems because they said, well, wait a second, we're going to get a $200,000 tax credit. And I said, yeah, you're going to get it in a year from now. Mm. You're not, don't have that money to spend today. Yeah. You're going to have to figure out where to get that. But in the case of, for example, well, I work a lot out of the Dominican Republic. In fact, I have two films coming up that are going to be fully financed uh, over there. But in the case of Georgia, state of Georgia, if you register the movie and you have your finances registered there, uh, whatever you got, the rebate, you can take it into an agency and they would advance that cash against shooting the film. Okay. Well, first of all, it, the state of Georgia does not offer a rebate. It's, it's a tax credit. Mm. And you have to do that, okay, mm. because unless you're doing business... By the way, you opened up the whole tax credit thing. I mean, yeah. this is this <laughs> yeah. is like another thing. <laughs> I, know. I specialize I, yeah. in this, okay? So yeah. so I can tell you literally every mm. state and exactly yeah. what they offer. Mm-hmm. I mean, I literally have the maps. I study this stuff because yeah. I know I want to know where to shoot mm-hmm. and I want to advise people, mm-hmm. right? So the state of Georgia, it's, it's, you know, obviously a huge, huge production. You know, mm-hmm. Georgia's gigantic for production. Yeah. It's one of the biggest now. Yeah. Because, but it's a, it's a tax credit. Yeah. Okay. And the reason you actually have to sell your tax credit there, unless you're doing business in Georgia and generally independent producers don't have production companies there. Mm-hmm. So you're going to take that tax credit and you're going to actually try, it's what we call transfer. It's a transferable mm-hmm. tax credit. You're going to mm-hmm. sell it through a broker to exactly. a, a local Georgian company mm-hmm. that can use that. And they're going to discount it. The problem with that is, and it's not good for small budget indie films. It's good for big budget stuff because they generally have their own operations there. The problem is you're going to pay a brokerage fee. So let's say you're going to get, just to keep the numbers simple, okay, it's a $100,000 tax credit. That's what you're entitled to because that's, you know, based on your eligible costs and all that, you've earned a $100,000 tax credit in Georgia. All right, you're going to sell that tax credit to a Georgia-based company through a broker. The broker is going to take anywhere from 5 to 10%. So let's mm-hmm. call it, let's say you make a good deal and get a 5% fee. Mm-hmm. So they're going to take 5000 Okay, Then the company that's going to buy your $100,000 tax credit is going to mm-hmm. want a discount on it. They're going to probably want to buy it 80, 90 cents on 80. the dollar, 85 cents. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they're going to give you you know, 85,000 yeah. mm-hmm. minus your brokerage fee of 5000 So your tax credit is not 100000 exactly. It's 80000 mm-hmm. And you got to know how to do that math beforehand because a lot of indie producers don't factor that in. Exactly. Then all of a sudden they're twenty thousand dollars short. Yeah. And you know that's real money. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, sometimes that is the information that doesn't get to people, and people assume that if we go to, let's say, uh, New Mexico, oh, we're going to have thirty five percent, or we're going to have this and that, but they don't factor in. Those elements that you well, just said. Okay, and there's more to that. Okay. Mm-hmm. So so let's look at you know, New Mexico, okay? Mm-hmm. That's a good one. Or, mm-hmm. you know, I recently shot in Oklahoma, a really good one, okay? So let's say they're offering a thirty percent that a rebate means you don't even have to file your taxes. It's just yeah. money coming back again. So let's talk yeah. about a rebate. It's clean, it's yeah. easy, it's the best thing for indie filmmakers. Okay. Right? So but it's based on what we call qualified expenditures. Exactly. Eligible expenditures. Exactly. Okay. So there's lists that the film commission or, you know, tax authority publishes, and they say, this is what qualifies. So often a indie film producer doesn't factor in that certain things don't qualify, like exactly. generally their own salary because yeah. they're from out of state. Now, some credit, to, you know, film, mm-hmm. we, we call them, you know, film incentive programs mm-hmm. actually do qualify, that, that does qualify, but you have to check that because yeah, exactly. you might have your director, your producer, and your, you know, your number one A-list star, which could be a third of the cost of your budget doesn't qualify. So all of a sudden you thought, okay, I'm spending a million dollars and I'm going to get a 30% tax credit. So a $300,000 you factor in, but you realize only $700,000 is qualified expenditures. So you're only getting, you're getting 210,000, but you calculated 300,000. So you're $90,000 off just because you didn't, you know, Mm -hmm. you didn't, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, calculate it properly. So that's a typical error. Now, do you want to know why that happens? It happens because indie filmmakers are artists. They're not business people. If you're a business person, you're fake, you're t- factoring all that stuff in. But if you're an artist and you say, and they all, listen, I consult with hundreds of indie filmmakers mm-hmm. and 90% say to me, Jeff, you don't understand. 
I'm an artist. I am not a business person. I signed up to make the movies, not to sell them or to do all the tax mm -hmm. credit calculations. Mm -hmm. Other people do that. Mm -hmm. And I say, that's fine. You just got to make sure that there's other people doing it for you and doing it properly. That could be mine, actually. Mm -hmm. It's in my briefcase. Um, you got to make sure that it's factored in. So yeah. even, listen, even my students, they all say, they have to take my course in order to graduate because it's mm -hmm. required. They yeah. all say, do we really need to know this stuff? And I say, you don't, you're not likely not going to do tax credits. All right. But you need to know what the guy in the other room is doing. You right. need to know what, because this is going to factor into how many shooting days you have, how much money you have. You know, this factors in, it's super important. So I'm not saying you have to do it. Right. You just have to understand the narrative. So at least you heard you, when the conversation is going on, you know, the terminology, mm -hmm. you know, the concept, you know, the difference between a transferable tax credit and yeah. a rebate. I'm not saying you have to process it, you know, unless you want to, maybe that'll be a career choice you make, but at least know what's being talked about. I think it's great. great. This is a lot of great information. <laughs> and, um, and certainly to have the right people, if you like, you're right. Artists don't, aren't that great with budgeting. Fortunately, you, you can do both. I know you started in distribution and then moved into filmmaking. And I, I imagine because that was the process that looked like the most fun to you and you wanted to get more involved in that. And uh, so this has been a lot of great information. Um, I'm looking forward to get, sitting with you again. We want to talk to you about distribution. So um, for now, if you, if you want to know more about Jeff, you can go to his um, website, uh, deverettmedia.com and get information there. Also, if you want to get involved and learn more about the Film Hub, check out, follow our Instagram and our Facebook, and, and you can go to our website, thefilmhubinc.com. So, uh, okay, I think it's been a great time, yeah. and we really appreciate the information. I'm looking forward, and he got to come back to talk about distribution. I think <laughs> yeah. distribution is a big thing. I think after budgeting, I think distribution uh, is the single most thing in the minds of, of uh, director, producers, and everything, right? At least so, if you think I talked a lot in budgeting, <laughs> wait till we get going on distribution. Well, but you, we'll welcome <laughs> and, and, you back and, on that one. And marketing. In marketing. And marketing. Okay, okay. Right. there and we then, go. Then you're not going to get a word in edgewise. Okay. <laughs> Look forward right. to that, Jeff. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having mm, me. It's a pleasure. The Film Hub. Inspire the creative. Ignite the world.